I'm Dr. Derek Lee. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Smith. Uh, he's a former orthopedics, uh, chief of orthopedics at, at Texas Children's Hospital and former professor of orthopedics at Yale University School of Medicine. He's currently the chair of the Scoliosis Research Society's Comprehensive Care Committee on Non-Operative Treatment of AIS. I'm super happy to talk to, to Dr. Smith. We're going to focus on uh, the new uh, FOSS system, with, which is a met method of looking at skeletal maturity. And it also is a predictor of curve progression in, in uh, adolescents who haven't been braced. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Really a pleasure to have you on board. Well, it's a privilege to be here, and I look forward to our discussion. Can you talk a little bit more about the uh, FOSS system, how it evolved, and um, go into some of the details, how we can determine skeletal maturity and curve progression from that? Absolutely. Uh, happy to do so. Um, when I was at Yale for 11 years between uh, 2008 and 2019, uh, I was working with a team, and uh, we were very interested working with amongst ourselves with defining maturity. And one of my colleagues um, has uh, done a number of papers on maturity indices. Uh, and one of the things that came to us was that uh, historically, uh, orthopedic surgeons and others that care for patients with scoliosis have looked at uh, the Risser sign, the iliac hypothesis, uh, as a marker of maturity. And it, it was an easy uh, classification to remember, you know, one through five with zero, technically zero to five being the, the standards. Um, and generally, you can see that on a, on a standard uh, front to back or uh, what we call a PA x-ray of the spine for scoliosis. Um, however, as people got more um, savvy and refined in assessing maturity and uh, with uh, Jim Sanders uh, developing his Sanders uh, scale for maturity, we realized that the Risser sign was not as accurate as we would like. And, and our team at Yale was wondering, is there something else on the standard scoliosis x-ray of the spine that we could use as a maturity indicator? And most of the time, uh, most x-rays will have a shoulder or one of the shoulders on the exam, on the study. Uh, so we started looking at that and looking at the maturity of the proximal humerus physis uh, and how that changed over time from children, you know, even as young as six or eight years old, all the way up to 16 years of, of age. Um, and we were able, uh, working as a team, to develop a, a classification system that was very similar, in a sense, to RISR. We started with a system that was from one to five, uh, so people could remember that fairly easily. Um, and we were able to validate that looking back at our case series, and we subsequently presented it at the Scoliosis Research Society, uh, and our initial presentation in 2019 won the Hibbs Award, uh, which recognizes the best paper, uh, clinical paper at the annual SRS meeting. So we're really pleased with that. And since the introduction of the system, um, a number of institutions and um, uh, universities have taken it up and done some research on it. And it seems to be validated in other centers, which is quite satisfying to us. Um, the key is just getting a good x-ray that includes one of the shoulders with the arms basically at the side. We like to do the study with the hands um, uh, on either side of the legs, uh, palms forward, um, standing straight up. Uh, and usually that gives us a good outline of the shoulder. We developed a classification system that was one to five. Uh, as we studied the, the whole process of the maturity of the proximal humerus um, more over time, we actually separated our class three into 3A and 3B. And again, it's sort of, Jim Sanders had um, eight classifications, and he has a 3A and 3B and 7A and 7B. Um, the Sanders classification, which is a, an x-ray of the hand and risk for maturity, we still acknowledge is the standard of care. Um, but it, it's a system that a lot of people have a hard time memorizing. You know, there's eight, there's technically now 10 different classes in that system. So most people that use the system have in their office the picture of the Sanders system on a, on a wall that they can look at as they're looking at the x-ray and really define the level. Uh, we thought if we could get it off the x-ray uh, that you do just for standard scoliosis, you wouldn't necessarily have to do a hand film. Uh, and in our world, sometimes if we really needed to pin down the maturity of a patient in the middle of a busy clinic and they didn't have a hand x-ray, we'd have to send them back to x-ray, get the x-ray of the hand, which was disruptive to the clinic flow and just prolong the appointment for the family. So um, we've sort of moved 
uh, in a lot of our practices uh, directly to just looking at the x-ray, looking at the shoulder, de deducing or determining the, the level of the um, proximal humerus ossification system um, and using that as a measure of maturity, which we find to be fairly accurate and helps guide our treatment decisions about should we brace someone, do they have enough time left to warrant bracing, or is someone mature enough that we can start to wean bracing or even discontinue bracing? So it's, for us, and I, I, I would say that it seems like at a growing percentage of centers around the country and maybe around the world, um, we're moving a little bit more away from the RISA and looking at the FOSS as a, as a nice way to assess maturity in an accurate way from a standard, uh, what we call PA, uh, standing x-ray of the spine. Right. Just want to emphasize with Sanders, you'd have to take an additional hand x-ray in addition to all that, for sure. Do you find that, um, I suppose, if you had a hand x-ray available at the same time, you would cross-reference both Sanders and FOSS at the same time, or you would just kind of stick with the FOSS? We, we absolutely, if, if we're smart enough in advance to really know it's a decision about stopping a brace, you know, on a follow-up appointment, or, you know, because the question that every family has uh, of a child that is using a brace, including the, the patient themselves, is how long do I have to wear the brace? And the answer is until you stop growing. But as we well know, everyone grows at different rates. Um, each individual is unique. Um, obviously, in a rough outline, girls stop growing at about age 14, 14 and a half, and boys at about age 16. But some boys are done growing at 15, and some girls are growing at 16. So there's such variety to make good clinical decisions, and to the ultimate goal is to optimize the outcome of a brace um, in a patient that's using a brace to stop scoliosis progression. So as much accuracy, accuracy as we can give the family uh, and the patient to know how long they have to use a brace, or even if a brace is worth using, uh, depending on how they present, um, the more information we can give them, the better our mutual shared decision-making is uh, for determining bracing issues, starting a brace, continuing a brace, or ending ending bracing. Dr. Smith, um, I, I believe you do have um, some slides that highlight uh, more of the details of the FOSS system. Would you like to um, upload those? This is some work. We just presented this at the 2023 uh, Scoliosis Research Society, the modification that we did to our proximal humerus ossification uh, system, um, uh, focusing on adolescent scoliosis. Um, and I just want to point out that we had the privilege of working with Lori Dolan, who's a PhD at the University of Iowa, who was uh, one of the four author authors of the seminal BRACED paper from 2013 with Dr. Weinstein that really established the efficacy or the value of bracing in idiopathic scoliosis. Um, but uh, this highlights the RISER sign that um, has been tried and true in the uh, uh, tradition of looking at maturity in a, in a patient with scoliosis, uh, where it's a one through four, and then uh, five is actually when it's fused. And this highlights Jim Sanders' system, where you get an x-ray of the hand and wrist and look at the growth plates that start closing, what we call distally, or start closing at the fingertips and the last growth plates to close are at the wrist. So, um, but they close in sequence from the distal phalanx to the middle proximal phalanx, metacarpal, and then wrist. So this is still the gold standard. Uh, I happen to know Jim Sanders, he's a good friend, uh, and he, he's done tremendous work on this. This is still the most accurate way to assess maturity. But we thought, is there a way, just like you can see the pelvis on a standing uh, x-ray of the spine, usually uh, to do the wrist or sign, is there something else that we can use? And we came up with the proximal humerus. And this is our system um, from one through five when we first started. Uh, and the, these um, x-rays down here are actually from these films here. So from one through five, uh, we noticed in stage one that there was really a gap here between the epiphysis, which is the top of the humerus, the humeral head, and what we call the metaphysis, or the part of the bone that goes down to the shaft of the humerus. So stage one is really in young patients, usually under age 10, where there's a gap here. Uh, stage two is where there's much less of a gap, but the margin of the epiphysis is rounded. So it's not quite lined up with the metaphysis. That's what this line is doing here. And then stage three 
is where the epiphysis now is sort of flattening out here and in line with the edge of the metaphysis. Stage four is where most of the growth plate is closed down, sort of analogous to a risser stage four, and it's just open slightly, and it always closes from the inside, we call it medial, to lateral. So uh, it's still open a little bit laterally. And then stage five is when the whole growth plate is closed and you basically don't see any dark line. You can see how, um, again, this is a nice uh, uh, example of stage one down here and not a perfect example of stage two, but stage three where it's sort of open throughout, stage four where it's closed down to the inside and just barely open to the outside out here. And then stage five where it's closed completely. So for us, this has been a really helpful system. We have gone ahead and modified stage three, um, as you can see here. So again, stage one, stage two, where you see it's nice and rounded here. Stage three, where it's much more collinear, but still open throughout um, 3A. 3B, where it's closing down sort of medially or, or centrally, but still open laterally. Stage four, is still open slightly laterally. And stage five, analogous to RISR five, uh, where it's closed completely. So again, I think you can see the hallmark of the stages uh, here. Um, yeah. The important thing that we've realized is that it does correlate well with maturity. Uh, and we looked at a number of cases and what we presented at this SRS meeting in 2023 was uh, patients that Dr. Dolan gave us from the BRACE study. And we were able to go back and looked at all those x-rays. Some of them we could not use, but a, ma a majority of them we could use that could show us the shoulder uh, and try to determine um, uh, based on this simple formula, the risk of them progressing to a range where surgery would be indicated, which for most people is 50 degrees. Um, one of my colleagues working with me came up with this simple, elegant, and I think sort of brilliant uh, score. Uh, so we have the, the system and we also have the score. The Cobb angle, which is the angle of the scoliosis measurement, minus 10 times the humerus stage. So how does this work? If, if a, uh, a patient presents with a 30 degree curve uh, and their, uh, their shoulder stage or FOSS stage two, um, so 10 times two is 20. So Cobb angle 30 minus 20, which is the numerous stage times 10, leaves you with a, a value of 10. And what we found basically is that simple arithmetic that even orthopedic surgeons can do in their head in the office, just looking at the x-ray looking at the, the shoulder stage and looking at um, the, the, the Cobb angle, they can come up with a number. Basically, if that number is over five, there's a huge chance that untreated, that patient will reach a, a surgical threshold. If we take a 30 degree curve and their sh shoulder stage four, 10 times four is 40. So a Cobb angle of 30 minus 40 is minus 10. Their risk of progression is almost uh, nil. It's almost negative. It's almost zero. Um, so um, this simple score is something that we're trying with another literature paper to get validated. Um, we presented it, but we haven't published it yet. And we, we hope to publish work on this uh, within the next six to, to 10 months. But we're excited about this as a very simple means, relatively simple means of knowing that before you even walk in the room and talk to the family, if you know the Cobb angle and you know their, sh their shoulder score, their shoulder stage, you can calculate the score and really reliably tell the family how significant is their risk for progression to uh, a surgical range. Um, so we think the modified FOSS system can be used um, and obtained without, without additional time of sending a patient back to x-ray to get a hand film if you don't remember to get one in advance when they're doing their scoliosis x-ray. Thus, it saves a little radiation, it saves a little time, and a little bit of hassle uh, in terms of the flow through the clinic. And, and this simple relationship of Cobb, Cobb angle minus 10 times the humerus stage um, helps enlighten you as to whether or not that patient is at high risk or low risk or moderate risk of progressing without treatment to a surgical threshold. And basically any, any score through this uh, simple uh, equation that was greater than or equal to five had a very positive predictive value of reaching surgical range of almost 95%. So we were proud of that. We're trying to make life easier for those of us that care for scoliosis patients. If you don't have a hand film, you can look at the shoulder to really assess maturity. You can still look at the wrist or sign, but we think the shoulder is even more accurate than the wrist or sign. Uh, and then not only knowing that the shoulder stage, 
um, you can actually calculate a risk of progression um, using our simple formula. So um, we're excited about this. I think more institutions around the country and around the world are using this uh, just as an adjunct because it, it's so important for us to be able to tell the families how mature is your, your daughter, how mature is your, your, your child in terms of the risk of scoliosis getting worse. As we all know that growth is a relative enemy uh, in scoliosis. The more you're growing, the more likelihood you have for the curve to get worse. But once you stop growing, if we can keep the curve under 40 degrees, um, you should be great and you should live happily ever after um, with a scoliosis that should not bother you in your later life. So anything that we can do to enhance our understanding and our knowledge of the patient's maturity and help give them the best recommendations um, for treatment, and especially involving bracing, um, we think this is uh, hopefully another helpful way to assess the risk, um, assess their maturity, and with shared decision-making with the patient and the family, um, make the best decisions for any individual patient. Um, yeah. So we're excited about this, and hopefully that it, more people will use it as it becomes more, more popular. Well stated, Dr. Smith, because uh, I don't think it can be um, emphasized uh, too much that uh, determining the skeletal stage is critical in terms of trying to determine uh, uh, treatment protocols for that, for AIS. I can't thank you enough. Thank you for inviting me for this interview. And if it helps the cause of scoliosis patients, um, I'm thrilled to do so. Very good.